On March 8th, Dr. Ciotola from the Queens County Department of Health visited the Queens County Commissioners to give them an update on COVID's impact in Queen Anne's County. Let's say the last eight months since July 1st of last year has been a challenge. And we have adapted and overcome several obstacles. The most pressing of which is since December 3rd of last year, with the cyber attack to the Maryland Department of Health, we have not had access to our computers or our data. We have, to, we have no internet in the health department. We are using essentially hotspots off of cell phones. So it has made it challenging, but we have adapted and we've continued to, to plunge forward in getting the responsibilities and the needs of the community. I know this has got to be a 10 minute presentation, but when you look at what the county has had to go through since July and dealing with COVID and then the Omicron variant, which really took us for a wild ride in December and January. And when I show you the numbers, you will actually see what we've been dealing with. One of the other pressing issues is looking at the rate of positivity and the case rate. And I will gladly tell you it is time for a breath of fresh air. The state's seven day average of positivity sits at 1.6%. Mm. Queen Anne County is sitting at 1.2 as of this morning. The, the case rate for the state is 5.7 for the last two weeks. We're at 3.1. So we have definitely seen a decrease in activity with COVID. As you know, our schools are now no longer mandated for facial coverings. This is personal choice. And the same way that this county has been for a long time, <coughs> personal choice in public areas and meetings. We still need to protect our vulnerable health care facilities. It's still mandated. So, so how are we on uh, transportation? It still mandates on, no. on transportation? No, it's it's that. Bus. Buses, school buses? School buses, no. Okay. Okay. Where we sit is with the federal mandate, which is essentially trains, planes, okay. and commercial buses that are running through federal highways. Okay. So, we presented basically showing what we've done. We were averaging about 600 PCR tests a month since July. We did essentially a thousand PCR tests in January alone. We distributed after purchasing 32,000 rapid take home tests to the public. The health department bought those because we could not get them from the state. Thankfully, we are now being reimbursed by the state as we put the request in. Matter of fact, this month we got 10,000 and my plan to put in and get an additional 10,000 over the next two to three months to cover the 32,000 that we purchased. We have been giving these out not only to the county agencies, but through the libraries, both Kent Island, Centerville, and the Settlersville Private Library, and with the cooperation of United Community Fire Department, Kent Island Fire Department, and Settlersville Fire Department, we're able to give out those 32,000 rapid tests to the general public. We were also giving out N95 mask and KN95s. There's your test graft, and we're going to fly through some of this. I think this tells the whole story. December 21, we had 1,873 positive cases. In January, 1,879. 
Look where we went in February, 254. You talk about over 100%, I, yeah. And where we stand today, we're sitting at 12 positive cases so far for the month of March. So you can see this drastic change. You look at where we are now and look back to June of 21, where we all thought we were hitting that nice sweet spot of being through the, the, the worst of this. But I'm a little concerned that we still have to be vigilant for our Easter holidays and our spring breaks. This is hospitalization data. And up to this point in time, the total number of hospitalized patients was essentially 296. And that has been since the beginning of the pandemic. Unfortunately, our deaths were 103. A large majority of those came out of our, our assisted living and nursing homes. But when you really study this, you look at the number of comorbidities that the number of these patients had, and you look at the age distribution, and it really shows where the majority of the high case rates. And really, when you start looking at this, it's in that 35 to 44 year old area, all the way up to 95 and 110. And you see a big, huge percentage, almost 15%, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54. And that's where you start seeing <coughs> your hospitalization number go up. Now, when you look at under 19, we essentially, the entire pandemic, have had seven pediatric hospitalizations. Thankfully, no pediatric deaths. And that's your total case rate. All of this will be available from QAC TV, linked to the presentation. So anybody in the public that wants to look at this. Vaccination percentages. When you look at the percentage for total population of what we are at about 50,000, you see that we were doing pretty good considering that in our greater than 12 years of age, and greater than 18, percentage of fully vaccinated at about 73 and 75%. Looking at our most vulnerable, greater than 65 years of age, we did 90% of those individuals. You see a decrease in the amount of booster percent, and that's not uncommon right now because we're still going through that booster period, and some people are opting not to have the boosters, and when you look at the number of individuals that were hospitalized, 2,504, or positive cases rather, positive cases, 2,546 of them Did not were have. fully vaccinated and still got it. So there is herd immunity, there's immunity from having COVID, and in some of the studies now show that the antibodies that you get from having COVID last a little bit longer than the antibodies that we're getting from the vaccine. And what we have done over the last six months is run a test with our health department employees who have volunteered, as well as our Department of Emergency Service personnel doing antibody levels. And it's very interesting to see the variation in antibody level post-vaccination and post-booster and we're also now doing those that have had positive confirmed COVID by PCR test and see where their antibodies are or if there are any at all. This continues to really evaluate and look at how COVID has responded to these vaccines. That's a good reason, presentation of how many we vaccinated. Now remember, we didn't get the vaccine Till when? End of December, beginning of January, right? Yep. So you see November, December, January 22. It was slow coming out. 
obviously doing vaccinations back in July of 21, but we ramped up in November and December. Well, we weren't slow it was the supply from the state. That was the problem back then. Our problem has always been, and the same thing with the rapid take home test. Yeah, they were sending us 300 a week. Right. What am I going to do with 300 a week? Well, we got a population of 50,000. So now, despite COVID and despite everything you've seen, what we've been doing, as you see the, the mask giveaways that we were doing, we were making sure that everybody had as many masks as they would want. And thankfully, they were well received. We distributed about 54,000 of the N95 and the KN95s. This is looking at your death by group and age group. And you can see where the majority of our deaths occurred were anywhere from 75 up. You started to see a significant percentage of deaths. And that being because of the significant amount of comorbidities that we found in this patient population. And doctor, we talked before the meeting. Can you share with the public people hear the word comorbidity and some people I don't well, let's think talk understand about what, what those underlying things are. What are those underlying conditions? Right. Obesity. Obesity, diabetes, congestive heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are some of your major contributing and congestive heart failure are some of your comorbidities that led to death. Let's face it, as a health system, the United States failed their public. If we could have addressed those comorbidity conditions prior to the onset of this pandemic, what would have our fatality numbers been? What would our hospitalization numbers been? What would the death rate have been? Had we had a healthier society, the first thing we need to address is improving the overall health and our population. And I think, and I think that, that that would be the silver lining of the cloud that will come out of this, is, is well, we'll have that factual data of, to say. That is one of the things that I would like to have our health department and the University of Maryland medical system look at, look at the comorbidities of the people that passed away from COVID and what could we have done differently but the big thing is, let's start talking about our children, our younger age group. How are we going to fight childhood obesity, childhood diabetes, and change this perspective because we see what happens when something like this occurs. And one of the major things that we've started in the health department is working a A1C program for diabetes with the county employees we're also doing it with some of the private practices using our mobile integrated health team. Matter of fact, this past week, we were down at Sanitary working with county employees to start working with their A1C levels. This is voluntary, but this is to improve the overall health outcomes in not only our workforce, but the citizens of Queen Anne County. So people that are volunteering for that program, because it was interesting, I remember getting the, the information about it. But are these folks that have it already, yes. have high, have, are dealing with, are, are meds have, and dealing with A1C I, levels? We did not get a lot of pre-diabetics with it. They are already being treated for diabetes, but we're trying to manage their diabetics. The plan is to start looking at those individuals that are pre-diabetic or have essentially clinical findings of increased sugar levels and start working with them, but not only from a nutritional standpoint, but with monitoring their A1Cs and also increasing their activity level and exercise level and healthy eating. So, so real quick too, so I know it's probably still too early to see any of these numbers, but have, have we looked at, at the rest of the world in terms of their comorbidities and figured out who the healthiest country is? I know the U.S. is and obviously, but I mean, where the death rates were lower and is it uh, stress? You know what I mean? There's other, I, I got to believe there's other factors, factors yeah. uh, that play in, you know, living in, in big cities, obviously. I'm sure that 
over the next six months to a year, that's going to be the focus of a lot of studies, mm -hmm. a lot of clinical studies, a lot of epidemiological studies. And motivation and would, to make changes. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. But just because COVID was going on, and we that's your hospitalization slide broken down in a graph, pie-shaped graph. But the normal function of the health department still continued. We were continuing to do our health preparedness. We were essentially vaccinating for flu as well as COVID. We did our investigation for 21 rabies exposures, basically been still doing TB screening and flu <coughs> vaccines. And we've uh, also had still <coughs> administering the flu vac pneumonia vaccine for our elderly population. Our community wellness program was working pretty strong and up until January when things really started off coming off the rails as far as cases. So I pulled the team back. The team is now going back out as of March. At the very beginning of March, we are starting all of our home activities again. We are seeing patients actively in the health department. We've cut our vaccinations down to two days a week. We've cut our testing down to two days a week because we're trying to get back to the business of the health department, not just pandemic. The vaccinations are still by appointment? Yes. Can they make appointments that day or is it at least 24 hours? Um, Does probably because we're vaccinating in the afternoon, they can probably call in the morning, but preferably they call 24 hours before. Yeah. WIC program, we're getting back into the home. Healthy families, the same way. I know I'm flying through these, but everybody can have access. Health insurance program, children, reproductive health, family planning. We have done a lot of telework, phone appointments, but now we'll get back into in-person. Cancer screening and prevention. And one of the big problems with this, trying to get people scheduled for mammograms, colorectal checks, is a lot of the practices weren't seeing patients. Mm -hmm. So there was a very limited availability of medical services to these, but hopefully as the numbers have come down now, we can get back into doing what needs to be done. Our AIRS program, the same thing. We've been doing a lot of this with telephone, limited home visits, but we're gonna get back to full scale involvement now. And the same thing, with our mobile integrated health team. Mobile integrate has been out there doing boosters, testing, assisted living, vaccination, employers, and we will continue that. Also, the other priority in the county is substance abuse and prevention. And we've been doing a lot of stuff with the peers by phone and teleconferencing, but now we're getting back into one-on-one -on -one person to person face to face meetings and treats. Environmental health, never, never missed a beat. 576 building permits, doing the food, surveillance, rabies. Thank you. Mm -hmm.